My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And, wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we have a returning guest, someone that we love. We loved our conversation last time, so we are sure, 100% sure, that you're going to enjoy this conversation because it piggybacks off of that last conversation. It's Dr. Evan Alexander, one of our favorites. Now, just to give you a, a recap of what his story is about, he's an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years. In 2008, he experienced a transcendental near-death experience during a week-long coma from an inexplicable brain infection that completely transformed his worldview. He's the author of the New York Times' number one bestseller, Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven and Living, and also Living in the Mindful Universe with Karen Newell, who's also with us today. Karen is an author and a specialist in personal development with a diverse body of work that rests upon the foundation of heart-centered consciousness. Now, as an innovator in the emerging field of brainwave entrainment audio meditation, say that five times fast, <laughs> Karen Newell empowers others in their journeys of self-discovery by demonstrating how to connect to inner guidance, achieve inspiration, improve wellness, and develop intuition. We have a lot to, to talk about, Ms. Newell. She's the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics and the co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe with Dr. Alexander. I want to extend a very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you for being on the Skeptic Metaphysicians today. Well, so great to be here. Thanks so much uh, for having us on. Yes, this is going to be fun. I can tell already. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yeah, we, we definitely <laughs> uh, want to focus on the fun, but this is very serious information we got to get out. So we got to temper the fun and focus on the informational entertainment. It, what they call it? In, infotainment? infotainment? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just to give a recap, Dr. Alexander, uh, your near-death experience was, when I read the book, I was entranced. I'd never heard of a near-death experience quite like yours. For, the, for those that may not have listened to the interview before, and if you haven't, I strongly urge you to go back into our archives and find that interview with Dr. Alexander because it was absolutely fascinating. But can you give us a, a quick recap of what your experience was? Yeah, very briefly, uh, you know, I was 54 years old. I thought I understood brain, mind, consciousness. I taught 15 years at Harvard Medical School, taught neurosurgery. And that's why I was in for such a shock, because this is completely unexpected if you have been uh, brought up in the conventional uh, materialist position, thinking brain creates consciousness. Because in fact, what you find out is when your brain and body die, your consciousness is greatly liberated to a much higher, more active state. So the exact opposite of what I ever would have thought. Uh, very briefly, I went through three realms, uh, earthworms I view, very primitive course on responsive realm, but then ascended through a light portal uh, and a music portal up into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. And from that point, another musical portal provided by the angelic choirs took me to the core realm, complete oneness with the divine. Uh, I cycled through those realms multiple times. It was crystal clear uh, that God force of pure love at the core of each and every one of our awareness. Um, and this, and, of course, is when your brain wasn't able to. When my brain, it. yeah, you didn't mention my, you had yeah, meningitis. I, yeah, I had a severe case of bacterial meningoencephalitis that basically rendered my brain inoperable for seven days. And mm -hmm. it was during that period that I had this extraordinary set of visions. Uh, uh, it really the medical facts of the case completely uh, obliterate the chances that that brain could have harbored a dream or hallucination. That's why the scientific community takes my story so seriously. Mm. Uh, but the reality is I've spent the 15 years since then working with scientists around the world, uh, studying consciousness with other experiencers, and especially with my spiritual mentor and partner in all of this, Karen Newell, uh, coming to some deeper answers. And of course, that's what we uh, put forward to the world in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And that's what all of our work is about, is helping to change this world and point out that there is a revolution going on in science around the nature of reality and that the old conventional materialism is dead 
right. and replacing it is a much richer form of understanding reality where we're all united through one mind. Uh, and it's a very rich, uh, uh, reality that we're bringing to the world. Right. So uh, longtime listeners uh, know me and know my pragmatic approach to these topics and things like that. So longtime listeners will also understand why I get so giddy when an academic <laughs> neurosurgeon starts talking about angelic choirs. I mean, this is just not something you you think about when you're in the pragmatic world, right? It, when science has ha, fought against the the thought of consciousness existing beyond the brain, um, to have someone come in who is a neurosurgeon who mm -hmm. understands the brain so well and talk about the fact that yes, this is reality. That makes me very happy. So <laughs> and relieved. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the one question I always like to ask people that have had a, a near death experience is now. How do you feel about death? It, it's a it, liberate um, conscious awareness to a much higher level. It's a reuniting with the, the mind of the universe and with our uh, loved ones who have already departed the physical world. It's a joyous transition. Uh, I mean, similar to birth in so many ways. So it's just uh, uh, a deeper understanding of this big picture can be very comforting. Right. I do like it similar to birth. That, that's it's like rebirth. That sounds so much better than death. Second birth. I'll take that. <laughs> that that's kind of what it is, right? You're being reborn into who you really are. At least mm -hmm. that's what we're. That's what the, the messaging that we're getting now. Doc, a brief question because I know we. I want to talk about secret acoustics here, but it, it, any chance that this is a passing a, a consciousness for a little while before your brain completely dies out, or is this a you feel it's an ongoing for for good kind of experience? <laughs> Well, it's important to point out that there are shared death experiences, which are like near death, but happen in perfectly healthy people, but have all the same ingredients of, of, a, of a near death experience. And especially important to point out, you know, as I realized after my journey, reincarnation was absolutely crystal clear. And yet I didn't know any scientific basis uh, for reincarnation. Uh, and then I started studying and found out that in fact, at the University of Virginia, very close to where we live, uh, They've been working for six decades and more than investigating more than 2,700 cases of past life memories in children, of which 1,700 of the cases were soul. That is, they actually found the person who lived before. Now, children can talk about past lives, and most people don't do the research to try and find out if the words they're saying match a reality of somebody who lived before. And yet, when scientists do study this, it's not just the UVA group, but Jim Matlock and Carol Bowman and other investigators. Uh, you find that there's a huge amount of evidence that uh, children can have past life memories. And then you extend that into the world of transpersonal psychology. And you realize all of us have had prior lifetimes that helped to explain the events of this life. So that's mm -hmm. how you're answering. Yes, this well, doesn't just end. After yeah, the time. reincarnation it's stuff continuing. is so powerful. Right. And you have to fit that into some context. And the context we fit it into is near-death experiences, shared death experiences, after-death communications, the fact that the hospice literature perfectly aligns with this, with people who go on to die. They have the same experiences as in the ears. So uh, it's all about a bigger reality. Also, the data on the hospice study, Dr. Christopher Kerr out of Hospice Buffalo, he did all these studies and interviewed people who were actually dying, the, really the first study of its kind. And they all... Uh, felt like they were that, that they were going somewhere. They felt one of the themes of their end of life dreams and visions, as he called them, is that they were traveling and they had this anticipation of what was coming next and loved ones would show up, but they wouldn't necessarily tell them where they were going. They knew it wasn't the end. And that's what people realize mm. when you go through this natural, uh, not sudden or violent death, but a natural death due to disease or something in, in hospice. That the process begins, uh, the life review begins, you start, you know, going back into your past and figuring out how you could have done things better. This is what near-death experiencers tell us. And this is what actual death experiencers tell us. What I love the most about this data, for especially for those skeptics, is that near-death experiencers, including Evan, talk about how what they encounter is more real than this world, somehow more real than real, they say. And these folks who were having the end of life dreams and visions who are actually dying, they say the same thing. They say it's different than normal reality. This, you know, when they're asleep, they call it a dream. When they're awake, they call it a vision. But it's all the same. 
the hypnagogic state, the state between awake and asleep, which leads us nicely when you're ready into sacred acoustics, because our recordings are designed to help people get into that hypnagogic state. And that's what we naturally enter every day as we're falling asleep, but most intensely when we're going through that natural process of dying. So it really confirms for me very clearly that what near-death experiencers describe is also what actual death experiencers describe. So I'm pretty mm. confident even having not had in your death experience that we will not be ending our awareness when our physical body dies. And that's something mm. that's very useful to at least be aware of, if not fully prepare for. So mm. that's, uh, I think I, what happens when we die helps us live our lives more fully. That's the most important the message. Key. Yeah, it, it helps us, period. Because <laughs> it helps me because my entire life, my biggest fear has been death. I've been deathly afraid of death, pardon the pun. Uh, and and knowing, hearing stories like yours, Dr. Alexander, and um, all the other people that we've spoken to about this, it, it provides a, a great sense of comfort that, yes, there is something else beyond this. And we don't have to fear death. And you're connecting the dots now between what happens when you die. And of course, reincarnation has to has to follow suit. So you're there for a certain period of time before you move on to the next life. So that makes perfect sense. I just wish we didn't have to forget. Most people don't have memories of past lives, just kind of walking through our life and our culture. And yet it's because as the doctors who've investigated these children will tell you, those memories start to fade at age six or seven. And often mm. by teenage years, they don't remember any of it. But just imagine if you did remember. What if you remembered all your big, happy life events would be like, opening all your presents before your birthday, right? <laughs> you knew all of the bad sort of challenges that were coming up. Uh, I think you might run away or, you know, self-sabotage what, what those uh, important hardships might teach you, mm. right? That are hard to go through. You think, why would I want to do this? But you come out the other side really transformed. Uh, I'll give an example of a, this has been on the news lately, a CNN anchor who just got diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. Mm. And what she says is that this is a beautiful gift because it teaches her how much she is in love with this life. She's not ready to die. She has young children. And so this diagnosis of a terminal disease has enlivened her life. It's made her realize, oh my gosh, I got to make the most of everything. So imagine how if we all realized that without getting such a diagnosis, right? That we could really start enlivening our lives and forget about that fear of death. It's more about let's make the most of this life before we have to get out of here. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a fair point. If I knew that I was going to continue, I probably would live my life a little bit differently. So you're right. Yes. I, yeah, I just, I just, I just want to, I'm a control freak and yeah, I need to know. I, know. I need really, to know. Well, I think, Will, for you, if you remembered all your past lives, you know, and there was like a really good one, I think you'd be so disappointed now. You'd want to go back and that would just cause you more strife. So yeah, I think you know, for you, I think it's better to not remember. That's true. That time when I was the king, when then yeah, life was good. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, then let's go ahead and transition to the secret acoustics because it does have a very close tie to this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, like I mentioned, I have been using them for a while and I love them. And in fact, there was a period of time where I was having a very difficult time getting to alpha, getting down even further. Th I mean, theta is the, where I want to get to and so infrequently get to. And yet when I started using sacred acoustics, I remember the first time I took my headsets off and I looked over at Karen Ensley and I said, my God, finally, I got back. I got back mm -hmm. to theta. So Sacred acoustics. Let's talk about the origins and the benefits from them first. Well, the origin comes from uh, my own personal practice of exploring ways to enhance meditation because I could not meditate. I, I didn't use language like get into theta, but when I would try to meditate, I learned all about the benefits intellectually. But when I tried, I couldn't do it. I mm -hmm. just my mind was just having all these thoughts as a busy project manager. You know, I was planning. Uh, reviewing. I couldn't quiet the mind. And so just through trial and error and trying lots of things, I found these particular types of sound would help me quiet the mind. And at first it was things like uh, gongs, uh, crystal balls, brass balls, anything that kind of makes that steady, wow, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems to capture your attention. 
And so when I would listen to these, uh, it would really be helpful. And I learned about binaural beat audio recordings, which as it happens, these types of instruments, gongs and crystal bowls, they're emitting binaural beats. So anything that's making that wah, wah, wah sound, that's a binaural beat. And so a binaural beat is when you put one frequency in one ear, a slightly different frequency in the other ear, and that's what creates that sort of monotonous, steady sound. And uh, doing this helps to bring your brain from the busy beta state, which is measured um, through electric signals coming out of the brain. Uh, 30 to, what is it? 12 to 30 hertz is the beta state. Under 12 hertz, that's what we're really interested in getting to. So 7 to 12 hertz is the alpha state you mentioned associated with focus, concentration. Below that, 4 to 7 hertz is the theta state. That's that hypnagogic state. That's the state between awake and asleep because delta, which is the sleep state, that's zero to four hertz. So many of our sacred acoustics recordings really focus on that space between delta and theta right around four hertz. And when you are fed those kind of signals to the brain, one of the, your first instincts really, or first uh, kind of influences is to fall asleep. But what you want to do is allow the body to be profoundly relaxed while the mind is still awake and alert. And if you're familiar when you're falling asleep at night, maybe when you're first waking up in the morning, we're familiar with that, where we might still be having some dream fragments. And these types of recordings can help people focus, help people sleep, but they can also help people get into very deep states have dreamlike sort of events start to happen. And you can even start to interact with uh, the experiences that you're having. And so we feel that it's a gateway to these spiritual realms. And all of us will have different experiences, just like with near-death experiences, because we're all unique. And so the recordings won't work the same way on everyone, but there's a wide range of uh, ways that people relax the most commonly uh, uh, respond most commonly with relaxation and a quieting of the mind. But mm. others might feel vibrations in the body. They might have a sense of uh, lights and color that show up. Lots and lots of opportunity there. Right. And do you find that these types of meditations work better for everyone? Because I know, like, for example, Will, sometimes he'll do the guided meditations where people are talking. And for me, I'm just like, stop talking because I'm just listening to them talking and I can't, you know, I can't not listen to them talking. Mm -hmm. So something like that, I think would be great for me, but I don't know if, if, is it like, does it work pretty much for everybody? They have both versions. Well, it works differently for everybody. And we do as, uh, yeah, we have both guided and unguided versions. So any recording we create that has guidance, we know that those words get in the way after a time, but especially for beginners, they can be very useful as you're kind of mm -hmm. learning how to interact in these ways. But yeah, guidance, non-guidance, this is one of the differences between people. And so mm -hmm. we try to uh, anticipate those differences. And uh, we, we do encourage people to, at to listen at least once to the verbally guided version, because then you'll get an idea really of what we intended these tones to support. But really, the sky's the limit with someone mm -hmm. who already knows how to kind of use intention and and find their way through these spaces. Some people find it to be much more easy than others. And uh, so for those folks, yeah, the unguided versions are gonna do, do the trick. Yep, and, and they have different versions for different things. Like they have the light body meditation, mm -hmm. they have the heart-centered meditation. They have lots of different options for those that are looking specifically for certain things. Before we keep going down this rabbit hole, however, we gotta take a quick break. When we come back, we are going to dive deeper into sacred acoustics, not only the technology of it, but also the reasoning for the time for, I mean, all, all kinds of things. I've got lots of questions for you. And, but then also I want to talk about your book, Living in a Mindful Universe, because uh, it is fascinating. And there's so much wonderful information in there that I really want to make sure we, we touch on those. Uh, but we'll do that right after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. We are talking to Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell, who are both here to talk to us not only about consciousness outside of the brain, and we'll talk about that once we talk about the book, but also we're talking about sacred acoustics 
uh, which is a series of meditation, recorded meditation audios. Uh, and, and I love the way you explain it, mind entrainment, because really that's what you're doing, right? You're training your mind to be either um, more mindful or more centered or maybe more free, right? There's different versions like what you were talking about, different versions of those uh, secret acoustics that help people and train their mind in very specific ways. Let's talk about the variety of audio recordings that you have, and they're all set to music and they're all have both guided and non-guided versions. My favorite is the free one that you have on the site, the Ohm. <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, it is the perfect gateway uh, audio into the sacred acoustics because it sets you up perfectly for what's coming. And that Ohm, when that Ohm comes in, oh, right, makes me feel like what you, Dr. Alexander, must have experienced in your near-death experience because it feels like this majestic kind of, whoa, and it just transports you into another world. So, What's the science by? We understand the binaural beats and the and the, and the whoa, whoa, the sound waves and things like that. But what made you craft these audio files exactly like this with this type of journey? Well, interestingly, uh, my business partner in sacred acoustics is Kevin Cossey. And Kevin and I had been creating these recordings kind of on our own, just for our own personal exploration, really. And then we met Eben, and he wanted us to, after listening to them, he was the third person who had listened to these recordings besides the two of us. He wanted to make them available to others. Now, Kevin and I had already created this Aum sound. Aum is something that's used very frequently in meditation to really help people get to that now moment, the here, the now, so that you can, you know, escape from all of your worries, concerns, and distractions. And uh, so we thought, let's do that. And vocalizing the ohm, I don't know if you're doing that when you listen, but when you also add your own ohm, you're bringing a level of vibration to the music that really helps yeah. your system to interact with the tones even more. Yeah. So I would it, suggest that it's not required. It, but it, it depends. we met Evan, uh, he, we learned that he encountered this divine Om force, uh, for lack of the word God not being good enough, he used the word Om because in the core realm, that's what he heard. And so we, Kevin and I took that opportunity to refine our Om recording, to get it as close as we possibly could to what Eben heard, which turned out to be rather impossible because... You know, those, those are ideal sounds coming from an ideal realm. And there's no way that the kind of limitations of four-dimensional space-time and physics in this realm would and allow the human to ear. All, and the human ear. Yeah. Uh, but one can get to those kind of idealized forms of the sound by using binaural beats to liberate conscious awareness. That's the mm. that's the real power here. And, it, and it's all always about putting that little voice in your head. You know, so many people identify with the voice in their head. Well, I love how Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, calls that the annoying roommate. Because yes, that's <laughs> what man is not your ally in coming to any deeper understanding of your relationship with the universe. And it's really by putting that voice into time out and, and becoming more aware and cultivating your sense of awareness of this inner observer that turns out to be a uh, parallel with the mind of the universe. That's where we start to really understanding this deep connection. So it's right. funny, the own recording that you really identified with, lots of people will say that, oh, I felt like I was home, sometimes they'll say. Or they say, oh, just like you, that's my favorite. It sent me into this beautiful space. Uh, you know, unlike any meditation I've ever had, we'll hear that sometimes. And then there is the other side, uh, where the ohm is rather spooky to them. Mm. And they hear this oh, 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 and they, oh, no, <laughs> and they're like, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, they want the tinkly bells and the angel sounds. And so there really is a wide range of responses. But I love that you found that to be your favorite because that's many people's favorites. And mm. many, not all, but many of our other recordings begin with those own frequencies mm -hmm. simply because they do, for so many, create this beautiful foundation for going even deeper. Or sometimes now, ohm, the own frequencies contain. Uh, somewhere around like 3.75 hertz. So the, the very high delta, not quite to theta. And then once you get into that deeper space, sometimes we'll feed in some higher frequencies, like maybe a little seven hertz or nine hertz to kind of to keep you relaxed. 
we kind of wake up your mind a little bit to give you some stimuli. So light body you mentioned is a combination of all these frequencies. So that is quite a trip. And we often recommend that one more for advanced listeners. Uh, but anyone can listen. There's no restrictions. Where I often recommend people to start is with that own recording and also the whole mind bundle. Uh, because the whole mind bundle includes recordings in delta, theta, and alpha. And so you can see how you respond to only delta frequencies, only theta frequencies, as many of our other recordings mix them up. This is just another way for people to find, how do I respond? What is it like to listen to just theta tone? And so the whole mind bundle was actually used in a pilot study that showed a 26% reduction in anxiety in psychiatric patients in Manhattan. And so wow. those wow. patients who weren't listening to music over the same time period had a 7% reduction in anxiety. So it was really quite remarkable when uh, these patients were given tools to bring into their lives and they were allowed to listen at any time they wanted that was convenient for them. And that's what the whole mind bundle recordings are, is that same set of recordings used in that study. And well, it that is yeah, the same listening protocol, same kind of guidance on what to do. That study is a peer-reviewed um, paper published in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases by Dr. Anna Usum in February of 2020, for anyone who's wow. interested. Great. That, that's really great to know, because that, that's the one thing. There's so many different recordings. How do you, where do you start? How do you, what's it, you know? So I just kind of picked some that, that seemed interesting to me, because... I heard through the grapevine that light body might help you go on a travel, on a journey. And that's the one thing that's been missing <laughs> oh my in my life. But This again. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Astral travel has been my thing, but I've never been able to achieve it. And when so. it happens, you're going to freak out. I uh, know. And, and you know what? It probably has happened. And I went like, oh my God, I'm, no, I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what people say, especially those who are really anxious and really enthusiastic about wanting to have one. That mm -hmm. enthusiasm seems to get in the way. Yes. <laughs> and then when you finally do have a little flicker, you finally relax and you have a flicker, you're like, oh my God, just like you said. And then you're right back in your bodies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. so frustrating. But it is it frustrating. But you got to keep, uh, it's the practice. It's the regular mm -hmm. practice, the daily, the nightly practice, you know, set aside several weeks of just, you know, this is what I'm going to do every night. And, uh, if you haven't already done that, you, you might see some results over time. But the well, mental techniques are important. That's why in light body, you know, we have all those frequencies, layers of frequencies going in and out. But we also include verbal guidance that uh, has you visualize your body's energy leaving out the top of your head to infinity, at the bottom of your feet to infinity, and then spinning around your body, the speed of light. Yeah, I mean, you just yeah. kind of imagine all this uh, energy moving, but... The classic kind of out of body uh, script is to imagine that you're go walking upstairs or going up an elevator, going downstairs, going down an elevator. You can also imagine that you're rolling like a log, you know, out of your body like that. Any of those kind of visualizations combined with getting into that hypnagogic state. That's why first thing in the morning or right when you're falling asleep is a good time to practice. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, beautiful time to practice put on that light body recording and uh see what you can do so well, that that's really interesting because I, I i meditate in the morning but mm -hmm. it's not first thing in the morning right i go up take a shower to have my cup of coffee and then i sit down and meditate because i'm awake then and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure i won't fall asleep but uh every time i've tried meditating immediately upon waking up i'm immediately back to sleep like in a second so <laughs> it's hard yeah. for me so yeah. would you it's recommend you're doing the right thing. And those who naturally fall asleep, you're doing the right thing. You want to be fully awake. But at mm -hmm. some point, you will get to the place where you can maintain that relaxed body and still be awake. And it can take a couple of years of, mm -hmm. of practice because most people uh, don't practice every single day, right? You probably get into it for a while and then you get out of it again. Well, Evan <laughs> does practice every single day. I uh, find it incredibly powerful stuff. So I use sacred uh, acoustics an hour or two every day. But most wow. people don't, I know when I was practicing out of body techniques, I would get really into it for a while and then I would stop, you know, get back to my life. So, uh, but if you keep at it, you'll get there. That practice, people have to practice football, baseball, uh, musical instruments. It's the same thing. So. Right, right. Yeah. 
So do you recommend people use it at night before as they're, go, as they're falling asleep? I, I, Not, I, lots of people do uh, to help themselves sleep. So the Delta recording will, mm. uh, you know, insomnia is a, runs rampant in this world. And so yeah. for some, we have a sacred sleep recording. You have sacred siesta, which you can use for naps because it has little wake up tones in it uh, so oh. that you don't stay asleep. Uh, the whole Delta can be used for sleep. But some people, when they listen before they go to bed, it's just the only time of day they can work in. But they will find that uh, it enhances their dream space. And if you're listening to light body as you fall asleep, sometimes your first out-of-body experience can take place in what seems like a dream. I know for me, that's what was, was the case. I dreamed I was out of my body. I thought I was out of my body. And then I woke up in my dream and thought, oh, you weren't in your body. And I laughed, <laughs> laughed and fell out of bed. And then I really woke up. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wake so up, the wake up. those kind yeah. of things can happen if you're listening to these re re kind of recordings at night or before you fall asleep. But trial and error, just give it a shot. See, see what happens for you, especially if you're not feeling like you're getting good results with the routine you're in now. Change it up a little bit. and. Uh, Trial and error is the biggest, really, uh, advice I can give anyone with any meditative techniques. Because I know when I would go to a meditation class, they would say, do this, this, and this. And it was strict. It was very strict. Mm -hmm. Hold your hands like this. Breathe like this. Sit like this. And it, trying to follow all those rules was really frustrating. But I found, oh, if I just didn't hold my back straight and just relaxed a little bit, oh, now I can get there. So I learned over time that... Uh, modify, modify mm -hmm. the instructions to, you know, make them work for you. We're all so unique. One technique is not one size fits all by any means. Right. So, but you, because of binaural beats and you have to have the frequencies in different ears, you, you really need to have headphones on, right? That, that's, yeah. that's my, my biggest challenge is as I'm falling asleep, I've got not these, but I've got my Apple iPod, AirPods or whatever you want to call them. They're still pretty bulky. So when I turn over on my side, when I'm a side sleeper, it wakes me up. So yeah, I need to can, find like. Yeah, but but yeah. there's there's ways around that. And one of okay. those is a product called Sleep Sounds. And what those are is a fleece band or some kind of fabric around your head. And they have the little pods in the fleece band. So you can kind of move it around so that they're right over your ears and get them in right the right place. But you can flip around in bed. And now they even have wireless ones. It used, it used to be they were wired. And so you'd get tangled in the cord. And that's Ooh. so. Uh, yeah, Sounds like a sleep apnea machine. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when you get the wireless uh, sleep phones, you combat that problem. So many, many ways around these kinds of uh, troublesome issues. Yeah, headphones, hard to sleep. But they yeah. yeah, definitely. But headphones yes. are very important because you're getting the left and right signal. And that's what creates a binaural beat is when you have two signals delivered in the ear. Now, there's also people who have hearing loss who will say, well, I am, I'm deaf in one ear or I have, you know, certain mm. hearing loss in one ear or both ears. And for that, we recommend this newest kind of headphone, these bone conduction headphones that often runners will use uh, because somehow they're more comfortable than having them in your ear. They rest just behind your ears on the bones and the vibrations are sent through the bones. So it completely bypasses the inner ear cochlea that is damaged in someone who has hearing loss. So lots and lots of ways to listen. Man, wow. have, have we done this interview right before Christmas? I know I would have <laughs> would have been on my Christmas wish list. Darn it. Yeah, nah, nah. <laughs> so maybe uh, Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is coming up. Thank you. <laughs> right, right. Change gets, right. yeah, make up a holiday. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Will Gets Headsets Day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, I do want to talk about the book, Living in the Mindful Universe. But before we do it, one last question about the uh, sacred acoustics, because uh, it's the thing that's held me back from listening to it as much as I would like to. The Each one so far that I found, they're all 39 minutes long. And sometimes, and a really bit, I, we work full time and I've got to be in the office or whatever. Do, do they have, do you have to listen to the full 39 minutes? Is there any uh, talk of possibly making a shorter, maybe 20 minute version of them? Or is, is there a method to this madness? Well, we do have 20 minute versions. Just ah, get that out of the way. If the, I could in not the find those. Bundle, in the whole line bundle, there's guided and unguided 20 minute versions of Delta, Theta, and Alpha. There and heart presence, 
is also a recording. That's all alpha, different levels of alpha. So that's a different kind of experience, but all 20 minutes. And the free download, the OM recording, 20 minutes. We know it's hard to work in 40 minutes a day. But when we first created this recording, Transcendental Meditation was fully out there. And 20 minutes was their recommendation. 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes twice a day. But for us, a 20-minute recording, it didn't take us deep enough to have enough time in those deeper states. And so we came up with 40 minutes. Uh, the reason we came up with 40 minutes is you can fit, well, 39 minutes, is you can fit two 39-minute recordings on a CD. So wow. uh, that's what we do for everything is you can fit 78 minutes onto a CD. So we got the longest recording you could have. And then we got started getting requests from people uh, about the 20 minutes. I don't have enough time. Some people like who use apps like Headspace or uh, Calm, mm -hmm. they have five minute meditations and they're like, I just only have five minutes. And I'm like, oh, oh you can yeah. get relaxed for five minutes, but you're not going to. Go to those deeper spaces. Yeah. And then the sure. acoustics was developed for. And so we don't want to shortchange anybody, but you can listen for five minutes if you like. Some of the recordings can be listened to for any length of time. Things like light body, if you stop in the middle, you're going to be in a very, very kind of deepest space of the recording. And so that might not be the best place to stop. Mm. You can, if you're experienced and you do some grounding techniques to sort of get your mind back to where you can function in your daily life. That's important. Uh, but yeah, that's all the considerations of timing. All right. That explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. We create, we've even created some hour long versions or 70 minute versions because we just want to go longer. Evan wants, he'll do it for do two it and a half hours. hours. So wow. he'll, bring them, he'll string them all together in playlists in our yeah. app for in the, iPhone. In the app, it works extremely well. You can customize and, and build these things together. And so he, real, he, you can come up with an eight-hour track if you wanted to. Yeah, so, and wow. people See, do that for sleep sometimes. They'll listen to Delta all night yeah. long. He'll set up like a 20-minute ohm and then light body. Right. And, mm -hmm. then, and maybe you know, like wow. something else. Coming out of that, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll blend them together, but there's a lot of power. Uh, yeah. If you explore the Sacred Acoustics website, she has a lot of information. Mm -hmm. They help you select what files you need for whatever you're trying to do. And also the so, contact form on sacredacoustics.com, it comes to me. So I answer pretty much all of oh. those questions. Oh. Some oh. technical ones I don't answer, but uh, if anyone has questions like you've been asking me, I, I answer oh, I answer a lot person. of questions. Yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Great. <laughs> it's so helpful. It's a strange... Uh, it's not a, a mainstream kind of habit, so it's not really known, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's not well known. So people do have a lot of questions I'm happy to answer. Which is why I was so anxious to get you on, on the show again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to get this well known, especially if it helps so much with anxiety. I mean, why isn't every therapist using this? Lots of therapists you know? are. They prescribe mm -hmm. these to their patients. Their patients come and get them. And that whole mind bundle, just so people know when, when that, uh, peer-reviewed case study came out, pilot study came out. That was February 2020, if everyone recalls, right before the shutdown <laughs> started happening. Oh, yeah. Anxiety uh, skyrocketed woo! around the world. So we made those recordings available for free, and they still are for free. Uh, it's a, one, a people's choice. You have an option to pay $19, a very reduced price, or you can get them for free. And oh. Anyone who does this has my gratitude for taking the time to, you know, attempt to reduce that anxiety. Because when one person reduces their anxiety, you're helping all of us. Oh, that, all that of is us, something yes. that it's why I made them available. Yeah, absolutely. That's incredible service. I know these are not easy to put together. I'm sure they take a lot of time and effort. So thank you for providing that as a service to, to people. That's It's a huge, it, absolutely mm -hmm. huge. A while back, I was thinking about how for me, the danger would be those long, because once I get into that state, I don't want to get out. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I would never get anything done. Yes. Like if I put the thing on the playlist, forget it. I'm out. <laughs> you know? It sounds like you have a more natural kind of ability to get quiet. And Well, yeah. it's funny because it was really hard for me. I was horrible, oh, horrible. And Will was like meditating every day. I'm like, nope, I'd try for five minutes. I suck and I'd stop. And then one day it just clicked. And ever since then, it's, it's like a, it's easier for me, I think, yeah. than him. Now we call her a bliss bunny. 
<laughs> it's funny how we're all so different, you know? Yeah. Evan has this beautiful reference point of his near-death experience. Yes. He can imagine what it was like to uh, be there. And voila, he can kind of return in a sense, not the same hyper reality. Right. But others of us, we don't have those reference points. So you have to create that. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, for some, it comes easier than others. Right, right. Okay, well, let, let's turn our attention to to the book now because it is a wonderful addition. And I say addition because your first book, Dr. Alexander, Proof of Heaven, was my entry, my gateway to you. Uh, when I read that book, I, I immediately reached out to you to see, hey, by chance, would you like to come on? Because it was such a earth-shattering view kind of uh, experience for me. Mm-hmm. So now you and Karen have co-authored uh, Living in a Mindful Universe. And I want to dive deeper into it because then you take what your experience was in that book and you expand it with the help of Karen into the consciousness and and where it resides and all that kind of stuff. So for those of us who are listening right now who haven't picked up the book, and you should, mm. but who haven't, give us a thumbnail review about what the, the, the book is about. Well, basically, I, I'll, I'll just um, start by saying that some of the leading uh, experts in the world in the scientific world of consciousness studies have endorsed this book. So Bernardo Castro, Ed Kelly, Bruce Grayson, Jim Tucker, uh, Dean Radin, Larry Dossi. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on of uh, uh, respected scientific minds who like mm-hmm. this book. In fact, Dr. Pim Ben Lavel puts it as one of the four main resources for what's called the one mind hypothesis, which is really where the modern science of consciousness is going. Chapter five, yeah. primordial mind hypothesis. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, but the, the, basically, it, it takes the 15 years of work I've done with Karen and with other experiencers and with other scientists around the world uh, to come to a deeper understanding of this and really paints a picture of where the world is headed. And where the world is headed is the opposite of the materialist pattern that uh, we were all basically taught, our conventional cultural wisdom or lack thereof uh, is materialism, which has really been eliminated in the modern scientific world as a uh, valid model of uh, the true nature of reality. And the the emerging models, as we point out, living in a mind-free universe are much more based in consciousness itself, that that is the thing that exists. And that in fact, the entire physical universe is a projection out of consciousness. But it, it's a, a great rescue for humanity because that conventional materialist science that I worship before my coma, and I do not use that term lightly, that would lead you to believe, that would scoff at you for claiming to have free will. They completely dismiss consciousness as an epiphenomenon of chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain. And there's no way you can inject free will into that picture. Uh, and, and that's a big error. That is pointing us in the wrong direction. Uh, and in fact, we do have free will and it, it manifests in the scientific world as quantum indeterminacy, as it's called. And if you chase that down the rabbit hole of quantum physics, especially witnessing in 2022, how the Nobel Prize Committee had the wisdom to give the prize for entanglement. Well, entanglement is a giant step beyond uh, the four-dimensional space-time and kind of local realism of, of the scientific world of Newton uh, and of the 20th century. But now we went beyond that. And that's where um, uh, this has tremendous power, especially for people to come to realize that when you go into your mind, you're not just going deeper into this, uh, you know, three and a half pounds of gelatinous mass sitting inside your skull. You're actually going out into the universe in grand measure. And that's why things like telepathy, remote viewing are very real phenomena of our ability to discern information beyond our normal sensory pathways. Mm-hmm. And it also has a lot to say mm-hmm. when you see the brain as a filter or transceiver of consciousness, how these extraordinary stories of NDEs where your consciousness is actually liberated when your brain and body die, not constricted and, and pushed to zero as materialists would try and pretend, but that's not the reality. And so when you put all of these facts together, not just near-death experiences, but shared death, which happened in perfectly healthy people, uh, all the information about non-local consciousness, quantum physics, which has been screaming at us the primacy of mind for the better part of a century. But uh, materialism was so deeply ingrained in our scientific circles that they couldn't hear the message of the empirical data and rational argument uh, mm-hmm. to point out that we're actually all connected through mind and that we have mm-hmm. shared meaning and purpose. And right. that's why this is such an important uh, book for humanity, because it really brings science and spirituality together 
in a way that allows individuals to use their meditation and centering prayer and, and modes of going within to enhance their lives tremendously mm-hmm. and end up showing the binding force of love, uh, all of our actions being expressed through kindness, compassion, mercy, acceptance, when necessary, forgiveness. This is how the world can come out a much better place. And that's what we cover in Living in a Mindful Universe with a lot of practical tools for the individual. And that marriage. Is that all? Yeah. yeah, <laughs> oh gosh. Right. I was listening to that description. Wow. Right. That marriage <laughs> of science and spirituality is exactly why I love the book so much because it speaks directly to me. And uh, mm-hmm. Quantum Entanglement was my jumping point, right? That was the the paradigm shifter for me. Once Quantum Entanglement was confirmed, I was, what? That's it. That's it. This is what I was looking for. This is the proof I needed. Now I can scientifically explain to myself how something like this could be possible because mm-hmm. before then it was like, I can't, I can't see it. I don't, I don't yeah. see it, but now I do. I mean, it's, there's so much more out there that we know. And I've often talked about the fact, Karen, if you remember that I always, I don't know, something in me thought that our brains was more of a safety feature for us. Like we were so much grander that we could possibly uh, comprehend or handle mm-hmm. in this three-dimensional space that our brains actually filters our grandness so we can actually deal Otherwise, without it, we would be <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> sitting in the corner rocking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And I just I think it's it's fantastic to take this. This is really intense and complex information when you get into the quantum realm, but also marrying that to just humanity and life in general and putting it together in a way that people can access it and understand it like your everyday person can read this book. You know, you don't have to have a PhD to be able to read this book and get something out of it, which is just well, that is so needed. Thoughts. So thank you. That was Karen's work. Yeah. She did a great- <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Karen. If I couldn't Karen, understand- tonight. No. Yeah. If I couldn't understand what he was saying, then he had to rewrite it. And, uh, and that's not easy with quantum physics, right? And I learned yeah. a lot. That's not a topic ever interested me. Uh, and so I didn't know anything about it, but I've learned quite a lot mm-hmm. about it uh, just mm-hmm. from trying to explain in layperson's terms what the heck he yeah. is saying yeah. and the book does that it's not it's more complex than mm-hmm. proof of heaven certainly uh we we said it was for the 12th graders because the <laughs> <laughs> was uh designed to be uh read by eighth graders the publisher kept telling me that your average reader has an eighth grade education so we stuck <laughs> and they with- kept stripping the science out of proof of okay. heaven so we Put so, a lot of that back in. So we like to say we went for 12th graders in the uh, <laughs> life universe, but not the PhDs. Right. So. right. <laughs> Perfect. Just, just for the record, the eighth graders could still get it because I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and the eighth graders love his book, actually. It's wonderful when young people uh, understand these things. And I'll also say that a lot of the PhDs love it, too. Yeah, so they do. Like, <laughs> you know, this, I that's promise the good you. news. Yeah. Right. That's awesome. Uh, that's perfect. Gosh. Uh, well, we're going to add direct links to the sacred acoustic website to the place to buy the book i know it's on amazon that's where i got it we'll, we'll add all those links to our site including uh dr alexander your information karen uh newell your information as well if there is uh, one last message you want to make sure that our audience truly understands before they uh, move on to the next episode what would that be well, I would just like to remind people that when we're talking about, you know, we're all connected in this quantum physics and this, that, and the other, what really all of that means is that it empowers us. What it tells us that our consciousness, our individual awareness is actually playing a role, interacting with all other individual minds in the world to actually create our unfolding reality. So when we look around the world and we see what's going on, we have ourselves to thank, okay? Because oh the outer <laughs> world is a reflection of our inner world. And that's why when each of us can go in and clear out those anxieties, how we can, you know, clear our emotions that haven't been properly processed or any feelings that we have that haven't been fully, you know, expressed and so on, you know, things we really want to say to our loved ones that we don't say. And then we get to our deathbed and we're like, you know, have all these regrets, you know, it really, this kind of theory that Evan is talking about, it's very empowering to us as individuals. It puts us directly in with the ability to manage our unfolding reality. And the way to start finding out for yourself is to uh, practice 
practice going within. The more that you find that inner peace and alignment with that essence of who you are, you could call it a soul if you like, the more that you do that, the more you find your outer world seems to rearrange itself to match what's going on in your inner world. That's mm -hmm. how we can all do a little experiment in our own lives to see if what Eben's telling us is true. And if you find that to be the case, yep, you're just like every one of us as a human. It's our birthright to understand this. Just wanted to make sure people knew that. And unlike, you know, practicing piano every day for two hours, this practice feels good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Usually. And this is really a revolution for all humans. That's, I think, the important message to your audience is this revolution has moved far enough along uh, that, um, you know, the scientific world is clearly shifting direction over this. And so by people practicing meditation and starting to live a life where they express love, kindness, compassion, mercy for self and others, this world will become a far better place as this message of oneness and connectedness works its way out to the world. Uh, we just put out a 10th anniversary edition of the book, Proof of Heaven, has 36 additional pages, which cover a lot of what's happened uh, since the original book came out. But it's really all about this optimism of this uh, paradigm shift in science of the oneness of mind and the primacy of consciousness that I think can cause a, is a great cause for optimism uh, in our modern world, where there's so much apparent conflict and friction and polarization. Uh, ultimately, that's all just a bunch of noise at the surface uh, comes from uh, fundamentalists who realize that their uh, unproven world is now being uh, threatened and discarded. Uh, right. There's a lot of turmoil on the surface, but the reality is uh, deep down through meditation, centering prayer, all of us can come to bring harmony and peace and uh, uh, prosperity to the lives of everyone on this planet. There's no way up but through, we like to yeah. say. <laughs> right. That's great, yeah. individual hardships that are collective hardships so look, we're gonna get there You're right i there's so i could talk to you for days <laughs> uh and and maybe so it just so happens that we're in virginia as well right i, I just spent some time in the shenandoah mountains for a, a solitary retreat for a while so i was close to you guys um maybe some point we'll go get a cup of coffee sometime where are you we're in uh in norfolk virginia oh, okay, okay. Very good. Uh, Dr. Alexander Karen Newell, thank you so much for taking the time and helping us to come to terms with the fact that we're so much more than just a three-dimensional body that we inhabit. Uh, if anyone is interested in uh, reaching out to Karen Newell or Dr. Alexander, all of those links will be directly laid in our show notes. So go to skepticmanivisition.com. You'll find their episode there uh, and you'll find all their contact information very easily laid out so you can uh, one click and you're connected. Once again, Dr. Alexander, Karen, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. It has been fantastic. Thanks so much, Will and Karen, for having us on. This has been wonderful. And very um, fun as it happened. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Mission accomplished. Excellent. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much. We'll see you again. All right. Thank, thank you. you. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. If you did and you feel called to give back, we invite you to visit our website at skepticmanaphysician.com where you can donate to the show or subscribe as a member through our Buy Me a Coffee campaign. Your support will go a long way towards allowing Karen and I to bring you these wonderful conversations and teachings in more and more robust ways. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care.